Hello guys and welcome back to another Alibaba video. Now it's been about a month since I released my first Alibaba video where I went on to say that I thought that the company at that time was vastly undervalued and why I was buying shares as a result of that. Now a month has gone by and I still think that the company is vastly undervalued and I'm still continuing to accumulate shares. And that has been by far my most popular video so far. So I figured that there are a lot of people that are either invested in the company already or are considering an investment but are looking for some more information. So I figured that it makes sense to do a follow-up video where I go into more depth in their financials, where I provide you with my valuation according to my discounted cash flow and earnings multiple models. And then at the end of the video, we'll go through some of the key risks and my reasons for why I think that the share price remains depressed even at this point, and why those risks aren't too much of a concern to me in the long term. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Okay, so if we just run through each of the inputs to the valuation model, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think that this video could go on for far longer than I would like it to be. So if we go current share price, that's $211, and that's taken straight from the market. Then we've got shares outstanding of just over $2.7 billion, and again, that is taken from Yahoo Finance, and that gives us a market capitalization of just under $572 billion. So this is a massive company, and I want you to bear that in mind, because I think that that does act as a defense against some of the risks which we're going to go through later on. So keep that in mind. Then we move on to one to five year revenue growth. Now, before I reveal the figure that I'm using in my valuation model, I just want us to take a look at what their historical revenue growth has been over the last four years. So in 2018, they achieved revenue growth of 58%, 2019, 51%, 2020, revenue growth of 35%, 2021, revenue growth of 41%. So absolutely massive numbers that they're putting in here. And if we go to analysts' estimates, so if we go to Zach's and we look at what analysts are expecting for revenue growth, now, we can't get a five year revenue growth, which is unfortunate, but we can get for years one and years two. So 2022 and 2023, we've got revenue growth estimates of 35 percent in year one and 21 percent in year two. So bear that in mind. Right. So analysts are expecting revenue growth of 35 percent in year one and 21 percent in year two. Now, in my valuation model, I'm going to go for one to five year revenue growth of just 20 percent. Now, considering their historical revenue growth and what analysts are expecting, I think that 20% is fairly conservative. Now, for 6 to 10 year revenue growth, you're not going to get any analyst estimates on that. So you've got to go it alone. Now, by that point, this company will be far more mature than it is now, which means it will be growing a lot slower. So I've gone for 6 to 10 year revenue growth of 12%. Now, for gross margins, we can see that the average of the last five years has been 50%. But we can also see that there's a general decline in those gross margins from 62% in 2017 down to 41% in 2021. Therefore, I've not used 50% because I don't think that's a fair representation of what the business is going to be achieving going forward. So if we just quickly think about why gross margins might be decreasing. So gross margins decreasing means that either you're unable to sell your goods or services for as much as you could previously, or that these goods and services are costing you more to be able to provide. And that's why you're getting a shrinkage in your margins. So I think that that's largely in part to two things. So one of them is a sort of change in Alibaba's business structure over the last five years. You know, they're acquiring businesses, and as a result of that, they're acquiring lower margin-based businesses. And then the second reason you've got is increased competition by the likes of JD.com, for example, who are effectively forcing Alibaba to provide their services at a lower price. And so that's why we're seeing that margin decrease. Therefore, I've just used the average of the last three years, which is 44%, which I think is more of a fair representation of what we can expect Alibaba to be making going forward. But it's definitely something that I'm going to keep my eye on. And if I continue to see gross margins decline, then I'll reevaluate my valuation and make an investment decision based on that. So to operate Operating expenses on the other hand have remained fairly consistent and so I've used the average of the five years which is 29%. Now one of the things that I love about Alibaba is that it is an absolute free cash flow beast. So over the last five years their free cash flow as a percentage of revenue on average has been 31%. That being said in 2017 and 2018 we've got 40% and 38% which is a lot higher than the recent years. Therefore, in my predictions going forward, I've just used the average of the last three years, which is 26%, which again, I think is conservative. And I think it's probably a fair representation of what the businesses can expect to make going forward. With that being said, 26%. Um, free cash flow to revenue percentage is absolutely amazing. So I'd be more than happy if they can continue to keep that up going forward. Now for the terminal growth rate, you guys know that I always use a percentage which is smaller than the growth rate of the economy in which the company operates in. So for this example, that is China. 
We all know how quickly China has been growing in the past, right? But just to emphasize that point, if we go over to this article here, we can see that since opening up to foreign trade and investment and implementing free market reforms in 1979, China has been among the world's fastest growing economies with real GDP growth averaging 9.5% through 2018, a pace described by the World Bank as the fastest sustained expansion by a major economy in history. So over the last 40 years, China's economy has grown on average by 9.5%, which is absolutely phenomenal. However, I like to be conservative in my estimations and also realistically, they're not going to continue to achieve that into perpetuity, which is effectively what the terminal growth rate is trying to achieve. And so I've gone on the conservative side just to be safe and I've gone with 2%. Now for weighted average cost of capital, we can see that that's calculated as 9.7% and that's calculated from the inputs to the table above. The only thing that I've really changed apart from those which are specific to Alibaba is the expected market return. So usually I would input around eight to nine percent here and that's a compounded annual growth rate and that's what the market will generally expect from the S&P 500 over a long period of time. However I've increased that up to 12 percent just to increase our weighted average cost of capital and the reason I've done that is although we're investing uh, in a company that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange it's a company that operates in China so it comes with added risks and therefore I've sort of increased the expected market return just to try and account for that a little bit. So that gives us a slightly higher weighted average cost of capital, which means that effectively we are discounting our future cash flows by a higher degree, which means that the present value of those future cash flows is slightly lower. So all in all, we're just being more conservative than we would be if I was to leave the expected market return at around eight or 9%. So Alibaba's balance sheet is absolutely fantastic. So they've got $71 billion in cash and cash equivalents, and then they've only got $22 billion in debt. And both of those figures are taken from the most recent financial results and then translated into USD at the current FX rate. And then we are forecasting a tax rate of 18% going forward, which is just the average of the last five years as well. And that's remained relatively consistent anyway over those five years. So each of those inputs has been used to populate our forecasted results, and that will be used to estimate our intrinsic value for the company in our outputs table in a moment. But just before we get onto that, right, let's have a little bit of an overview on how the company has performed historically using the three key metrics that we like to look at. So that's revenue growth, earnings growth, and free cash flow growth. So revenue growth over the last five years has been absolutely phenomenal. You just have to look at that chart and it speaks for itself. Nothing more to add on that. They are just growing like an absolute beast. And then we've got earnings growth, which isn't as impressive as revenue growth, but that's to be expected in a growth company as a lot of their money is effectively reinvested in the business to allow the company to grow. And that is why we can see growth rates like we see here just because that so much money is being reinvested into research and development and other ways of growing the business. And then if we go across to free cash flow growth, again, that's looking very strong as well. So similar to the revenue growth graph, um, I'm very happy with that. So that brings us on to the outputs of the discounted cash flow and earnings multiple models. So the discounted cash flow model is giving us an intrinsic value per share of $373. And if you remember that the current share price is only $211, that shows massive upside potential. And then if we go to the earnings multiple model, now we're estimating that the earnings in 10 years time in dollars, it's going to be 75 billion. And then we've put an expected PE ratio in 10 years time of 20. And I think that's fairly conservative. If we look at the sort of historical PE ratios for Alibaba, we get a median of 33 and a mean of 35, the blended of those two being 34. Of course, the sort of PE ratio is always going to drop as a company gets bigger. Um, just because the growth potential of that company is less. So I think that 20 in 10 years time is probably fair. And that gives us the price per share in 10 years time of $559. And when you discount that back to today using the weighted average cost of capital, then we get an intrinsic value for the earnings multiple model of $221. So that gets us to an average estimated intrinsic value of $297, which is a margin of safety of 41%. Now, when you consider that this is a $600 billion company, to find a margin of safety of 41% is absolutely, it's mind blowing, it really is. However, the reason we have that margin of safety is down to the fact that there are a lot of risks which exist with the company, you cannot ignore them. So as investors, we can't just be so bullish on a company without considering the potential downsides. So let's get into the risks and then at the end, we'll consider whether despite those risks, it's still a worthy investment. Right, so risk number one is a potential misrepresentation of financial results. So Chinese companies over the years have developed quite the reputation for effectively publishing fraudulent results, um, inflating their numbers, uh, obtaining foreign investment, and then running off once all is revealed. 
so much so that there was actually a Netflix documentary on it called China Hustle. Now, for those of you that haven't seen the China Hustle, I thought that I'd drop a trailer into the video because um, it is quite interesting. If you haven't seen it, um, maybe you should go and do so. But anyway, let's take a look at the trailer. What is capitalism? It rewards those who work hard, but it also rewards those who take advantage of others. After the mortgage crisis in 08, everybody's looking to get their money back. China's this exploding market. It blew my mind. Let's invest in it now. Everybody thought, I want to be a part of the China growth story. We're making a profit. $22 million, $100 million, $20 billion. $50 billion. This was simply too good to be true. And it was, if this one company is so brazenly fraudulent, we have to worry about all of them here in the United States. This is a perfect storm. Hundreds of billions of dollars that just poof vanish. There's an old joke that the biggest lie on Wall Street is that this time it's different. <laughs> And one of the US short selling firms actually featured in the China hustle, Muddy Waters Research, recently revealed the accounting scandal that was going on in Looking Coffee where they had inflated their sales. And so this is something that is still going on recently and that was in April 2020. And the share price fell from, I think it was $50 down to $1.39. So it is a real risk and it's a risk that still exists today. And it's not that Alibaba don't have auditors because they do. So they're audited by Hong Kong PwC. The issue lies in the fact that the Chinese Communist Party won't allow anybody externally to come and actually verify those results. So we are relying on Alibaba and we're relying on Hong Kong PwC, but we can't actually verify them any other way. And that fact makes a lot of investors outside of China very uneasy and actually leads quite nicely on to risk number two, which is the risk of Alibaba and other Chinese stocks being delisted from US exchanges. So because a new law was passed in 2020 called the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, any publicly listed company has to confirm or declare that they are not owned or controlled by any foreign government. In addition to that, if the company does not allow the audit of specified reports by the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, then they will also be delisted for that as well. Now, there are a few reasons why I'm not too concerned with the possibility of delisting. Now, first of all, Alibaba have already come out and said that they don't foresee a problem in complying with these new rules. And so that's a good sign straight away. Secondly, I don't think it's in anyone's best interest for a bunch of these Chinese companies to be delisted from US exchanges. So from the Chinese company's point of view and also China's point of view, delisting from US exchanges effectively cuts them off from capital markets. Now that's not going to be beneficial for Chinese companies and also the China economy to grow. And that's obviously in their best interest. So I don't see that happening from their side. Now, from the US point of view, there are over $2.2 trillion worth of Chinese companies listed on their exchanges. And of course that will generate them a lot of revenue. And so I think that they are more likely to want to reach an agreement with these Chinese companies rather than completely cut them off. Of course, they want them to be audited. They want to be able to rely on those reports, but they do want them on their exchanges as well. So I do think that an agreement is more likely to be reached than a complete delisting. With that being said, there are frauds and misrepresentations which occur in companies all over the world, whether they are audited by a big four firm or not. I mean, I could point you in the direction of a bunch of companies which have committed fraud um, whilst being audited by big four firms. So it's not something that is exclusive to China that exists everywhere. And there's not an awful lot that you can do as an individual investor to really mitigate that. And then the final risk, which actually is probably two risks in one, is the fact that when we invest in some Chinese companies, we do so through a variable interest entity. Now, a variable interest entity refers to a legal business structure in which an investor has a controlling interest, despite not having a majority of voting rights. Now, I don't want to make this any more complicated than it already is, but in effect, Chinese law forbids investments by foreign investors in particular industries and the e-commerce or the internet industry is one of those and so there is a workaround in which we invest in a variable interest entity instead and effectively there is an agreement between the variable interest entity and Alibaba the actual company um, to effectively transfer the profits from one to the other. Um, I think it's best demonstrated by a picture though so we'll get that up. So this arrangement works through the use of three separate companies right so we've got company A which is Alibaba Group Holding Limited and that is the company that we as investors are investing into and that is the variable interest entity that sits within the Cayman Islands. Then that has a 100% owned subsidiary known as a wholly foreign owned enterprise and that sits within China so it's registered in China and that has an agreement with company C. Now, company C is actually Alibaba, the trading company. And that agreement states that effectively all profits which are earned by Alibaba, the trading company, are transferred to the wholly foreign owned enterprise company B. 
And because we are 100% owners of company B, we then have a right to all of those profits. Now, one of the issues with this is that the contractual agreement between company B and company C states that company B is entitled to the profits of company C. However, they are not entitled to the assets of company C. So if any of the owners of company C, the trading company, were to remove any of its assets or all of its assets, there would be nothing that company B and therefore company A, which is as the investors, would be able to do about it. And so that is always a risk that it doesn't provide you that control over the company like a normal investment would. Now, the reason I don't consider these to be a massive risk is because these variable interest entity arrangements aren't something that's unknew. They've been going on for a number of years and decades even, and largely they haven't caused any problems. And so I don't consider the risk to be so significant that I wouldn't invest in a company that has this arrangement. And then secondly, this hasn't hurt Alibaba's share price so far. So we've seen around 175% increase in Alibaba's share price over the last five years compared with the S&P 500 of 107%. Now, well, both of those growth rates are great, but we can see that Alibaba has far outperformed the S&P 500. And if this was really a massive risk to investors, we wouldn't have seen growth to the extent that we have seen so far. And so there's no reason for me to believe that this particular risk is going to hinder growth going forward, considering that this arrangement has been in place from the very beginning. And then last, but by no means least, is the risk posed by the Chinese Communist Party. So back in October 2020, Ant Group, which is a 33% subsidiary of Alibaba, was due to list in Shanghai and Hong Kong. And that was until the Chinese Communist Party effectively stepped in and said, no, we don't want that to happen. There are some regulations that we want you to keep up with. And effectively, it was all very last minute. And as a result of that, Alibaba's share price plummeted. And actually, I think that that spooked a lot of investors because they realised that the Chinese Communist Party can effectively step in whenever they want with no regard to investors or the company itself and impose restrictions which are going to harm the company long term. But the way I see it is this, right? So the Chinese Communist Party are going to want to continue to see China's economy grow. And it makes sense for them to do that. So the way in which they do that is ensuring that their homegrown businesses, such as Alibaba, Tencent, and the other large Chinese companies are performing really well. So it doesn't make sense for them to effectively kneecap these businesses and, and prohibit them from growing as well as they could do. So while they may impose some restrictions in the short term, I think in the long term, it's only going to be focusing on long term growth for the economy. So whilst I certainly expect volatility in the short term, I think in the long term, we're going to see an upward trend in the share price of its company and in the value of Alibaba. Anyway, guys, I've been going on for longer than I need to be doing. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and until next time, guys, thank you.